In the age of ancients, the world was unformed, shrouded by fog. A land of grey crags, arch trees, and everlasting dragons. But then there was Seath, and with Seath came disparity. Seath, and Seath, Seath, and Seath. And of course, see. Then from the dark they came. Seto, the first of the dead. The witch of Isolith and her daughters of chaos. Seen the Lord of Sunlight and his faithful knights. And Seath the Scaleless betrayed his own and the dragons were no more. So why Seath? Well, Gwyn was a pushover. I mean, like, real easy. I bet even casuals like Lobos Jr. could do that run. <coughs> I mean... No, I needed something more difficult. A run that had a constant threat of getting insta-killed by a health-having debuff from AoEs blasted by a laser-firing albino tentacle dragon gifted with the ability of no clip and bullshit. Let's jump right in. I created a crystalline hellscape of mangled seeths, their ruptured skulls screaming out from the pain that poured through their now infinitely stretched pain receptors. Who better to put them out of their scaleless misery than my poor imitation of the Chad Hoppet? I opened the cell door to be greeted by a... rather... excited tentacle. Much to my disappointment, a lot of the seeths in Asylum had been reduced to severed tails, a fact that thrilled certain members of my degenerate chat. Their degeneracy was only further intensified by the constant sloshing of Seath's wet noodle limbs, a cacophony of octopus-themed fuckery that would barrage my ears for the entirety of the run. Entering the arena, I was confronted by a suspiciously placed hentai appendage. Fortunately, neither this nor the invisible tendril guarding it was the boss. Similar to the Asylum Gwyn, the Asylum Seath was unreachable during the first encounter as he spawned on top of the arena. Based on past experience, I knew he wouldn't spawn up there in the second encounter, so I mentally prepared myself for the formidable obstacle to come. After the Gwyn run, I had grown stronger, my brain had swollen larger, and I was cockier than ever before. I researched extensively, brainstormed strategies, did mock battles, all for the hell that would be Asylum. And now it was time. Time to show this motherfucker what I- And he died off screen. <sighs> Probably as a result of seeing those fucking messages coming out of my chat. Whatever, I was just gonna bait AoEs to kill him anyway. You- you really thought I was going to pull off some epic strat? Hell no, I wanted to get the fuck out of Asylum as quickly as possible. I picked up my equipment in Estus, got a cursed crystal shoved up my ass, sashimied some tentacles and flew out of there. Now, you'd think all his tentacles constantly filling up Mother Earth's bosom would be enough for Seath to conquer his blindness, but his crystal-induced madness not only drove him off the cliffs to his death, but also made him forget that he had wings. Interestingly, Seath does have his own falling animation, despite the fact that it would never appear if you were playing the game vanilla. Anyway, just like the old Gwyn run, I was able to exploit this and farm up to a comfortable level. And no, I didn't go max level. Even with this strat, it would have taken fucking forever, so please stop asking. 
Despite my relatively high strats, I still had to worry about curse buildup. Leveling resistance doesn't actually help at all, and humanity is generally pretty rare in all X runs, so armor and purging stones were my only real defense against curse. While I typically just level most stats to around the soft caps, I paid special attention to intelligence. Thinking back to the All Gwyn run, one of the major choke points was the infinitely respawning baby Gwyns that replaced the skeleton babies in the Tomb of the Giants. Now, imagine that all those bony boys were replaced with massive thick ass dragons. I would be completely body blocked with absolutely no way through. Thus, the plan was to max out my damage on Dark Bead to kill multiple seats at once and create a gap to sprint through before they all respond. Most of the run's route was built around the idea of overcoming this potential hardlock, and for entertainment's sake, I didn't even test if this was a viable strategy beforehand. Because I guess I'm a fucking dumbass. I don't With my leveling complete, I decided to head towards the Seathoris Demon. On the way, I stumbled upon the Seath species engaged in their annual migratory journey. Soon after witnessing this beautiful event, I was struck by the most bullshit aspect of this run. Seath's crystals not only have the most nonsensical hitbox, but they also travel through ceilings and floors. With my curse resistance as low as it was, this basically meant I had to book it any time Seath used his AoE. Thankfully, all I had to do was wait and allow the Seas to complete their final pilgrimage in order to get by. Shortly after, I randomly received the Moonlight Greatsword, which was utterly fucking useless against Seath due to his boatload of magic resistance. Oh, and if you were wondering, the enemy randomizer is coded to only allow a single tail cut drop, so this was the sole Moonlight Greatsword I received in the entire run. Crossing the bridge into Undeadburg forced me to see angles of Seath that I never wanted to, but on the other hand it was a conveniently safe passage. The undead Merchseath had unfortunately disappeared from his post, likely either falling off or dying to crystal AoEs, the latter of which made me aware of a very serious problem in this run. Because Seath's AoE was so wide-reaching in every axis, NPCs were far more at risk of dying than in the Gwyn run. If I lost access to a blacksmith, this run would be a whole hell of a lot more painful, a fact that riddled me with anxiety any time I was near them. My trek through Undeadburg was cut short by a laser, so I decided to take a short detour to see the graveyard. As per usual, it was an awe-inspiring portrait of absurdity. I then decided to head through New Londo towards Seathray, because unlike in the Gwyn run, I'm no longer a massive fucking idiot. I descended the New Londo elevator and got a close up of an idle Seath's pretty wings. Pretty fucking bullshit more like since these wings have collision and fucking body block me. Every time I wanted to go to New Londo, I had to whack these things for ages just to get through, and sometimes there were multiple of these sea glass wing ass have an ass motherfuckers. After shattering my way through, I navigated a maze of tentacles and talked to Rickert, who would be my backup Seath Dre if it turned out that I couldn't access him. Going up toward the Valley of Seeths, I jump attacked a stray squid leg and learned that this can remove a Seath from his idle state. While this would have sped up the previous portion significantly, I was far too terrified that Rickert would get absolutely blasted by crystals, so I never used this technique here. Moving on, Seath solidified his status as an absolute dumbass by refusing to use his wings and dropping off the cliff. But then, he showed his genius. What if, what if, instead of falling off the cliff, he simply became the cliff, truly an astounding play by Seath the Brainless. I picked up the Grass Crest Shield and, the most important item in the run, and continued towards Seath Tray. Huntre, is this you, buddy? Yes, it is! <laughs> it's him! No, come back down! No! Behold, Seath Dre, smartest of the Seaths. Unlike his brethren, he longed to soar through the sky with his wings. I frantically tried to find some way to tether him down, because I was pretty sure him soaring through the sky with his wings meant ascending into a fucking death plane. While it was possible to button mash and enter his dialogue, Seath Dre would quickly bounce out of reach and cancel it. He also had this weird habit of kind of clinging on to me, but that didn't help since the dialogue option seemed to be tied to the very center of his model, a model with an exceedingly fat ass that kept me a frustrating distance away from the press A to talk option. Desperate, I tried saving and quitting. While at first it didn't seem immediately helpful, it revealed an interesting mechanic of the Seath run and likely many other runs using the randomizer. Whether by using bonfires or reloading the game, the orientation of the spawn Seaths would change. This was most easily seen back at the new Londo elevator where the position of the wings would be slightly different each time I went there. 
According to Dark Souls hacker Pontagana, this was due to the Seath models pushing each other upon loading in, along with a number of other variables that produced these differential results. In Undead Parish, this had an additional effect. In most cases, reloading the game below the bonfire would spawn a rather static Seath Dray that body blocked the staircase of the parish. Reloading at or above the bonfire would spawn a glitchy ascending Seath Dray. With this pattern established, I first spawned a glitchy Seath Dray above the bonfire, allowing me to get down to the now empty anvil. I then positioned myself behind it and reloaded the game, spawning me inside of Seath Dray with just enough time to access the shop menu and buy thousands of arrows and titanite shards. As a hilarious cherry on top, I was able to slowly squeeze my tight ass through this tight ass space by sprinting, which apparently only works in one direction. Now, I typically never use save and quit out techniques because I reason if you do it to get past an area, what's stopping you from just quitting out the entire run and not fighting anything? I mean, like, what's even the point then? Where's the challenge? However, my general rule is that if there's a strat that is super interesting or funny as hell like this one, I don't want to miss out on it. Back to the run, I now had the standard all X weapons reinforced and it was time to confront the bellless Seath Goyles. Normally, one of the worst parts of these runs is the Channeler and his plethora of minions, but in this run him and all his groupies just took the fast pass to the afterlife, so I had no issue getting to whatever the fuck this was. Oh, it's not good enough? Alright you little fucker bastards, okay fine, you want more FOV? Here you go! Here you go. Oh, you want some fucking FOV? Now we're fucking master FOV, huh? Oh, look at that. Oh, you can see everything. Beautiful! It quickly became apparent that the three seats, yes, three, because one of the fucking groupies from earlier got cold tentacles and decided only to ascend to the roof rather than the death plane, the three seats were a bit too much for me to handle at this point. I would enter the arena and either get swept off by a tentacle or cursed in a matter of seconds. Thus, I instead decided to head to Blight Town to pick up the Crimson set to up my curse resistance. Before I left, I ventured a bit deeper into Undead Parish and witnessed a mesmerizingly apocalyptic apocalyptic scene. I got to Blight Town and caught a glimpse of a Seath glorifying his forefathers for bringing about this new age of scaleless dragons. I wasn't aware that viewing the sacred ritual was forbidden, and as punishment for breaking their holy law, I was telekineticized into oblivion. Running all the way back, I shimmied across some branches and picked up what would be my primary armor for the run, the Crimson Set. Since my character was very high level, I didn't put much further thought into my armor set after this, but for your information, here's the highest curse resistance build possible according to, according to me. Uh, yeah, a lot of the wikis and character planners turned out to either miscalculate or just be flat out wrong, so yeah, I did the work. I returned to Undead Parish and noticed that the bonfire was giving off a rather powerful Gwyn-like glow. This was due to some seat somewhere constantly phasing in and out of range of the bonfire, continually extinguishing and relighting it which compounded the light, which is neat. Back at the Seath Goyles, the third Seath had fucked off to who knows where, which was good for me. With my improved curse resistance, I was now ready for the epic dual Seath fight. I mean, like, honestly, what did you expect me to actually try? Do I look like a fucking casual? I'm not gonna waste my energy on some easy boss like Seath. <laughs> Real talk though, I was only able to do this because I was at the perfect distance for the Seaths to spam their melee attack and not their crystal AoEs. I defeated the two Seaths, rang the bell, bought five purging stones from Oswald, and set off for my next prey. Now that I had a bow and better armor, I once again attempted on Deadburg, staying out of range of the AoEs and slowly clearing out the area. Though his T-pose intimidated me, the Seathorus demon was evidently more scared of me than I was of him. No, 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 no! I took a quick detour to kill the High Seathdra and save Dusk, then proceeded to lower on Deadburg. Hard because it. <sighs> hey, did you like that clip? Are you tired of waiting for more content but are too casual to watch the streams? Well, boy, do I have a channel for you the Challenger Andy Clip channel, where you can find highlights. <gasps> 
extra content, and more Andy. No, 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 fuck you. Andy, you put the wheel panel part backwards. That's why the tube won't connect. No, you don't understand. Check it out using the link in the description below. Surprisingly, it was pretty damn easy leading up to the boss as most everything was quarantined inside buildings and some of them just immediately died from lack of purpose. For the ones that had spent their time making challenge run YouTube channels to ward off the existential dread, I was able to easily bait their AoEs for that delicious friendly fire. While at first I entered Seathpra's arena to fight him there, he and his drag dogs constantly filling the sky with crystals was too much for my crystallophobia. Crystallophobia is the fear of crystal or glass. Sufferers would not touch or even look at crystals. Nope, don't have this. I love Steven Universe. People who have this fear will not love Steven Universe. Um, this is about the real crystals and not the ones in the show. I bet there's a separate phobia for those. Oh my fucking gosh, these people. And I departed this life for one where Steven Universe did not exist. Once I respawned, I conquered my fear of crystals by cheesing the Seathpra demon from afar and made my way towards the depths. This alleyway here was the absolute worst part of the entire run. As you can see, it had become a flesh tunnel of emaciated albino dragons that fucked me in ways beyond human comprehension. Forcing me to take risks even when using ranged attacks, the Seas were determined to make killing them as frustrating as possible. They constantly flickered in and out of existence and body blocked me when I tried to run past them. I mean, just look at this fucker taunt me. It was infuriating. On the bright side, I was able to access the Seathmail Undead Merchant, though it took multiple attempts due to her preferring to be part of the sewer rather than confined inside of it. I bought enough purging stones to get me through the rest of the run, greatly increasing my ability to survive curse as well as relieving me of the half health consequence upon death. After finally dispatching all the Seath building hybrids, I entered the depths and was faced with more of the same. I did get this beautiful footage of my arrow shaving Seath's crystal body, and honestly, Honestly, you need to latch on to small details like this if you ever want to make it through these runs with your sanity intact. After clearing out the NC station, I grabbed the- Save Laurentius and walked under a disturbingly excited tentacle ceiling. I lit the bonfire so I could warp to it later, but didn't rest at it due to my fear of getting hardlocked in a spawn killing loop. I really only came in this direction to pick up the- But since I was this far in already, I decided to go for the gaping seeth. There was no bottom to the depth of bullshit in this area. I'd just hear a seeth roar, and then all of a sudden my ass would get tossed by invisible crystals, and the tunnels were frequently blocked by invisible seeth appendages. Pontagana speculates that this invisibility may be due to how the game engine draws enemies, hiding them based on the player's relative position. For example, when I'm in this corridor in vanilla, there's no need to visually render the enemies around the boss arena because there's no way I could see them from here. While that's fine for the original enemies, C's massive ass of ass frequently reached into areas it shouldn't. On a positive note, I went to the Amazon Prime same day delivery seat and was not disappointed. Unfortunately, my character had an aneurysm while trying to get to the gaping seat, but I wasn't too worried since I lit that bonfire and could warp to it later. Back at Firelink, I bought miracles from the bullcut bitch and journeyed to fight Queeth. Blight Town was the perfect depiction of what the Age of Dragons would have been like if they were all scaleless. A perverted labyrinth of slimy tentacles and glorified shiny rocks overlaying a putrid wasteland resulting from Seath's utter incompetence and madness. This is a good time to mention that poor vision was a common aspect of this run, but I was still able to see my chances of ever acquiring an ascended pyromancy flame get obliterated pretty damn well. Surprisingly, it only took a couple of tries to get to Queeth, whose wobbly stubby nub of a tentacle instilled within me a great feeling of unease. I eased my unease by easily easing my halberd into Queeth's sleazy torso and rang the second bell. I peered out the window to see Seath Yee fucking screaming in agony, so I went down to investigate and found that he had completely blocked the path to the scaleless lady. A reload sent him off toward the heavens, but sadly I was still unable to talk to his mistress. Down in Demon Ruins, Seathmas had come early, and being the Grinch that I am, I cut down the colorful tree of T-posers and slaughtered them all. Let me get this straight, you like Bloom? 
tired of pretending I don't. The grossly incandescent Seathless Discharge fell to his death and in his place spawned a funeral procession of Seaths determined to follow his lead by marching straight into the lava. Upon seeing the sky turn white with crystals and lag my game, I boned out of the ruins and set off for Seath's fortress. At first, he refused entry, but upon seeing that I was a Sunbro, he praised it and allowed me safe passage. Inside, I was welcomed to an all-you-can-seeth sushi buffet courtesy of the automated slicing and dicing guillotines. They were so effective that Seath's fortress was surprisingly easy. There was this spooky bit on one of the catwalks that had an incorporeal Seath blocking the path. While I could walk through it, I had to clip my camera inside of Seath's body in order to see the bridge as I stressfully shimmied across. My hypothesis is that Seath doesn't have a death animation specifically tied to fall damage, which may also include the trigger for him to fade away, so when he dies from it, he remains in the world as a T-posing ghost. I made it outside to the roof without too much trouble, visited the crestfallen merchant and bought everything he had, and entered the boss room to fight… the Iron Golem. <sighs> so I'm going to take a minute to explain the fucking migraine inducing bullshit I had to deal with. The Dark Souls 1 enemy randomizer, as we know, is not perfect. Certain enemies not being replaced, such as Wisps and player modeled invaders, was something I tolerated, but a boss not being replaced was unacceptable to me. What I found out was that the mod maker had made specific exceptions in the code for some replacements to be excluded, and Seath made up many of them since he had such a large model. Turns out, Seath never replaced the Stray Demon because he would have poked out of the floor, Capra and Iron Golem weren't replaced because they would spawn above the arenas and require ranged weapons, uh, frankly, it just sounds like fucking casual nonsense to me, so I fixed the mod and re-ran it myself. Actually, it was Alejandro and Turong who did most of the work, big thanks to them. Mwah. Together, we created several versions of the mod to redo specific areas that had been affected, and they're worth spending a bit of time on. The second run through of Asylum was much worse than the first time. While the replaced stray demon seemed to not have much of an effect, the Asylum Seath didn't die on his own this time. Fighting his tentacles inside of the arena was far too tricky with the restricted space. I instead spent an hour and ten minutes balancing on the small platform outside the fog gate. It's hard to tell, but I actually had to time my attacks with his in order for them to land. Not only that, but Seath was also slowly inching closer to me, which increased the chance that I was going to get launched off by his wings. Thankfully, it only took one attempt, but it was really stressful. I already showed the fixed Seath Pro footage, which is why I had different armor on during that section, and returning to Ironless Solemn, the Seath did indeed spawn in the air like the mod maker said, but he fell down to fight me after a short while, meaning it wasn't even a valid issue to begin with. I defeated him easily and traveled to Seath nor scaled which is the final place that was affected by bugs. Because the first and second playthroughs were roughly the same, I'm going to mix the footage from both so you might notice some inconsistencies, but past and Orlando, I didn't have any issues worth talking about, and the footage will all be from one playthrough. With that being said, let's continue with the run. I arrived in Seathnor Skaldo and immediately backed out to watch myself get assimilated into the FOV. I can see for fucking miles. Fucking miles. Back in Scale Nor Seath though, I watched a cocky Seath perform his last sick grind before breaking his ankle and falling to his death. I killed the Seath Gora with melee attacks to prove shooting arrows isn't the only thing I do in these runs, then shot arrows at the Seath guarding the chapel. Unlike the other randomizer runs I've done, Seath was able to actually stay on the rafters by wedging his body into the building, allowing him to body block the path forward and fling me off with his squid legs. After many deaths, I developed a technique that became known as the revolving door strat. Simply put, getting close to the far end of one of his tentacles semi-consistently baited Seath to rotate, allowing me to pass. It was less consistent and more semi than I would have liked, but I eventually made it across the rafters and spun the staircase all the way down to meet Dark Green Seathstolen, who sensed my powerful presence and immediately succumbed to my overwhelming masculine energy. Ascending to the middle level, I correctly surmised that the undulation of the Seath Goyle's tentacles against a wall would clip me through and allow me to proceed forward. I exploited this again to get under and through the Seath on the buttress and made it to the next bonfire, grabbing Havel's set on the way. 
The inside of the cathedral was hella annoying. Crystals constantly sprouted up everywhere out of nowhere, walls of fleshy members kept blocking me, and then unpredictable bullshit like this would happen. Very cool! Thanks for the skip, I planned that. Because the AoEs were stacking on top of each other, curse buildup became more of a problem here than almost anywhere else, but careful management of my purging stones and Estus got me through. After conquering the main section of this area, I headed towards the giant Seathsmith. Like Seathdre, he was body blocking the path to him, but unlike Seathdre, I was unable to use quitouts to manipulate his position. Also, the other way to him was guarded by a bunch of seats, and I really didn't want to risk him getting killed. I of course tried to jump over his wings, but I would just get stuck in a perpetual falling animation that would just start to kill him. In the end, I did a jump attack to get him out of his T-pose state, then moved forward and reloaded the game to de-aggro him. Fortunately, his crotch was far more open to speak with me than Seathdray's. In my second playthrough of this area, I was able to successfully jump over his wings, so it is possible to do it without quitouts. No fucking way I just did that! No fucking way! I bought Twinkling Titanite, all the arrows he sold, including great arrows for the Dragon Slayer Great Bow I picked up, and finally the Giant's Halberd, which would become my main weapon for the rest of the playthrough due to its lightning damage. Oh, right, and Solaire got blasted to death off camera. Now I am dead. I entered the fog gate to encounter Exocrystaller Smith and Dragon Slayer Seathstein, who had turned into absurd Bakugan versions of themselves. The fight with two Seaths wasn't that tricky. All I had to do was manage my curse buildup and I was fine. I did manage to get both phase 2 cutscenes here, but they were equally indiscernible. The Super Seathstein one does have this wacky screech though. After disposing of them, I went to Guinevere and asked what her cup size was. In response to my question, she gave me this large bowl for scale. Satisfied with this answer, I placed the bowl down at the altar and shot holy FOV across Lordran. Yes! Now armed with the Lord Vessel, I was ready to set off for the obstacle that I thought would kill the run, the infinitely respawning baby Skeleseeths. I tried my best to ignore the massive crystal testicle uh. guarding the beginning of the catacombs and got the bonfire. I decided to let just whatever the fuck was going on here work itself out, and got a terrifying view of several Seath undercarriages that threatened to AoE me out of existence. I attempted to clear them out, but some of them were just too enmeshed in the cave, so I tried to just sprint my way through. As always, I was unfairly bullied by this run's bullshit and got yeeted off the edge. I finally survived the fall and encountered Peeth the Wheelless. Ironically, he was the single most difficult boss in the run, as his constant battle with gravity clearly took precedent over his battle with me. The small arena gave me no room to avoid his AoE spam, so I had to continually manage my curse buildup and my health bar throughout the entire battle. I narrowly succeeded in first trying him, which is great because who the fuck dies to pinwheel, and was rewarded with some surprisingly gorgeous seats glistening in the darkness. There were many captivating scenes in the Tomb of the Giants, but this feeling of wonder was destroyed by something I had feared since the beginning of this run. Yeah, big doubt that I can actually... Patches, we don't have much time! Patches! <laughs> no! Is he down there? Patches, 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 my boy, my boy, my boy, my boy. Come here, come here. What? No! No, Patches, don't do it! I had to. He attacked me. What else could I do? After failing to save my trusty doppelganger, it was only right that I'd be sent directly to hell. The baby skeleton section was already horrific enough in the Gwyn run, and now with the enemies being a multitude times bigger, I doubted if it was even possible. I spent days on this next section and descended into a deep existential dread that I still haven't recovered from. Except I didn't because they all just fucking clipped out of bounds! Holy shit that was easy! What a fucking relief! Fuck patches! I never needed him! This run is too easy, man. It's so fucking easy. I mean, seriously, come on. All right, well, anyway, Sithito the Boneless was too good a name to pass up on, even though he clearly had a well-defined ribcage from which sprouted a neck that nearly rivals mine. Just look how you can actually half comprehend a disjointed polygon hand gripping that coffin. Fucking majestic. It's always moments like these that keep your spirits high in the run, and also moments like realizing your life isn't going to be spent farming baby Skeleseeth RNG for the next few months. Unfortunately, Seathito was joined by unreplaced skeletons, which we later found to be specially coded for this boss arena and an exception in the randomizer. 
I easily took out Cthito, and having gotten past what I thought would be the most difficult part of the run with barely any effort, I started to view the rest of the playthrough in a different light. To this point, it had been far easier than the Gwyn run in almost every respect, and I learned an extremely valuable lesson. When encountering a new, unique problem that has no lasting consequence for failure, always first assume that it is much easier and simpler than it appears. From this point on, I no longer defaulted to clearing out areas with my bow, and instead just tried to book it past all the Seaths. This typically worked in most cases as Seath really can't move that fast, and even if I got body blocked, I could now kill a single Seath fast enough before more showed up. I also no longer worried about becoming stronger or building my character, as I didn't think any remaining area would be more difficult. With that being said, I warped to the bonfire I had lit in the depths. Where's the fucking, where's the fucking death's teleport? Why isn't it here? Did I have to rest at the fucking bonfire? Are you shitting me? Are you shitting me? I have to do all of that shit again? Yeah, so I didn't fucking know you had to rest at the bonfire to activate the warp? What the fuck is even the point of lighting it then? Like, really? Because of this, I had to go through a fucking legion of seas that I couldn't book it through. Like, I, I, it, it fucking boggles the mind. What the fuck? Whatever, a after this bonfire, I was able to sprint most of the way unimpeded toward the boss. The gaping Seath cutscene was another goodie. Seath's moist raft neck peeking over the cliff was already great by itself, but the unveiling of his dragon tooth shaped slug like body was a whole nother level. And just get a load of how flexible that roar is. I slew the creature and went off to Seath's archives. You know, every time I visited the archives, I questioned whether Seath would be able to easily navigate his library considering his size, but what I saw next showed how foolish that question was. Seath's were squished ass to ass stacked up to the fucking ceiling, which really put into perspective how large the archives actually are. Thankfully, this wasn't too much of a problem for me, as they just blasted each other to death, including the one holding the broken pendant. I got to the fog gate without too much effort and got killed by the true Seath, who locked me away in the bad dragon jail cell for the grave sin of lacking the courage to replace this siren with tentacle hentai.wave. The self-intersecting Seath Promethean hybrid monstrosities would not allow my weakness to go unnoticed, and broke free of their prison to forcibly make me reconsider. I'm not sure where most of them went when the cutscene ended, but I did get some nice footage of that fall damage thing I was talking about earlier. Some of the Seath survived, and I got this never-before-seen footage of Logan's cannon death, stuffed full of quartz by the overgrown crystal lizard he spent his life simping for. What a way to go. I made my way out of the prison and stumbled upon a Seath overdosing on brightness. Back inside the archives before the next bonfire, Seath was determined to stuff as many of his tentacles as dragonly possible into my cha uh, into this chamber. I wasn't into that shit. And you know what else I'm not into? Making that cursed unlisted video. Oh, you fucking know what I'm talking about, you degenerates that clicked that secret link during the siren bit. You think I actually wanted to make the tentacle hentai dot wave vid? Because that shit probably just got me deranked. How I might be demonetized after this fucking video with the jokes I put in it. So are you really just going to sit there stagnating in the dirty waters of the unsubscribed? Do you know the risks I'm taking? I swear, I, sw I swear, I'm not like this in real life. Like, I'm just like a normal guy. Like, I'm not a degenerate. I totally wrote out a character like, shit, dude, like, mom, dad, grandma, please, like, forgive me. This isn't like who I am now. Like, I'm not really like- Getting to Crystal Cave was simple as the trees leading up to it tangled up most of the seats. As expected, Seaths fit in pretty well with the style of the cave, especially the clam replacements. I got behind a small opening, took them out using arrows, and went on to fight the true Seath the Scaleless, who presented the unique challenge of requiring me to knock over his shitty New Age art sculpture before I could damage him. I completely disrespected his claim as the original Seath by doing absolutely nothing special during our battle, and traveled back to Anne Seath Lawn Scale to restock my arrows. While there, I realized I had forgotten about the Hawk Ring that slightly boosts arrow damage. Because it was blocked by the giant Seathsmith's bespeckled booty, I had to jump from the staircase onto the anvil in order to get by and open the chest. I made my way back to Demon Ruins and, just for shigs and digs, I jump attacked the Seathmist tree to watch them all explode in a euphoric bliss. Oh 
my gosh. Oh. <gasps> no, this is the worst thing that could have happened. Further in, my retinas had a traumatic flashback to the All Gwyn run as the piercing orange light of Seath burned into them. I also found this incandescently gross noodle squirming above me, which was neat. I entered the boss room of the Scheme and Fire Seath, who ascended into the air, killed a sunlight maggot, and fucking died. The Crystal Peed Seathman was the embodiment of light and the color yellow, and actually survived far longer than I expected in the lava before becoming one with the macaroni. Continuing on, Seath in the distance frantically dialed 119 for emergency services, but they became delicious calamari before any ambulances could arrive. I ran through the lava, scurried under multiple seas, and slid into the bed of tentacles. After a brief wrestling match, I overcame the boss and thrust myself into the DLC. My victory over the Seathtuary Skeleton was another great illustration of how visually impairing Seath's crystals could be. Like the path to Crystal Cave, the forest of the Royal Wood greatly impeded the movement of most Seaths, allowing me to easily pass through what is typically an awful area. Seathtorius the Crystal Walker had probably the most incomprehensible cutscene in the run, looking like a coalescence between a stretched out wad of fully chewed gum and an alien conch shell. I disposed of him quickly and moved on. The outside portion of Ulysseal Township was uneventful, save for the Seath that successfully freed himself from the shackles of physical matter only to perish seconds later. Getting to Chasm of the Abyss was fucking atrocious. Just look at this horseshit. DPS would be stacking, curse would be building, my body would be flopping, and Seath would be squirming. And then shit like this would happen. Cool, cool fucking game. Anyway, I finally got to Chasm of the Abyss, a section I'm all sure you've been looking forward to, to see if my brand new PC would explode after replacing all the 40 plus humanities with seats. I'm sorry to say, but there were absolutely no difficulties in this area besides my own ignorance of where to go. All the seats just drove themselves off cliffs or died far off in the distance. I literally did not fight a single one besides the boss. While I'm disappointed that I didn't get to bask in the one of a lagging PowerPoint slideshow of countless seats, at least my GPU didn't fucking melt. I rescued the dog as is tradition and fought Cethus, father of the Ablis. Now, I'm sure most of you have heard of Dragon Ball, but now, get ready for... Ball Dragon. After a close call, I defeated him and saved Dusk. Big fucking Lamau. I backtracked to Ulysseal Dungeon and had a Seath kill the Mimic holding Soft's Tower Key, another one of the few enemies that wasn't replaced by the mod. I talked to Soft and had him try and shoot Calamite, but based on how his model looked in the cutscene, I'm not even sure that he had to use his bow, considering that his polygon body could impale Calamite from halfway across the fucking world. Was never loose. Dude, you are so fucking tall. I defeated Sklax, Scrag, and Scalaseeth and his companion almost flawlessly, and returned to the now fixed Northern Seath Asylum to kill the stray Seath. I was greeted at the gate by two Seath Onesans, who kindly lifted their skirts of fleshy feelers to let me pass under. Once I had fallen through the floor, I found that the stray Seath was actually above the intended arena, giving me a tactical advantage. I filled him with arrows, grabbed the painted doll with no issues, and booked it to Darkroot Garden. Once again, the seats were thwarted by their natural enemy, the tree, so getting to Seath was painless. The great albino skull Seath cutscene was, in comparison to the Gwyff version, a bit underwhelming. But of course, it wouldn't have been the Seath run if he didn't completely vore me. I let him do his little spin move with the sword before euthanizing him and traveling to Moonless Buttseath. In enemy replacement runs, the Moonlight Butterfly battles are always a bit stressful because if the boss falls off the bridge, it usually ends in a soft lock that requires you to dark sign or reload. However, I was able to sprint to the Moonless Buttseath before he felt the urge to move and killed him before the lag killed the game. Next was Painted World, the path to which was another labyrinth of tentacles. Considering that Seath was degenerate enough to pull a reverse furry and father a questionably canon daughter, it didn't surprise me that he had thrown countless other idiot children into the painting to neglect. The large number of seats made this area a pain, not because it was difficult or anything, but because loading more of the area brought my computer down to its knees. 
Thus, I had to resort to shooting a myriad of arrows to lessen the strain on my system. This is one of the many reasons why Painted World is typically in the top three worst areas in all X runs, but it does have one saving grace. I present to you the Obelisk of Seaths. Truly makes the run worth doing. And, as is tradition, I unnecessarily aggroed all of them for your enjoyment. Sadly, I panicked and spun my camera away from the action, but I re-recorded it in debug mode for this sick aerial view. Back to the run, I miraculously survived the obelisk storm of AoEs, whereas nearly all of the Seaths were erased. Some of them got so fucking obliterated that their severed tentacles deeply penetrated the ground, and when you get close to them, they do this. Fortunately, the sewers were completely barren as all of the seas had ascended to the surface and were likely killed in the earlier explosion. I got to the end of the stage and met Seath Scylla, who couldn't contain herself in my seductive presence and writhed incessantly as she told me to plunge. I took her advice and thrust my halberd into her slimy torso and got the fuck out of there. New Londo was rather uneventful since I played it safe to avoid getting blasted off the narrow walkways. Ingward was not as fortunate. Due to how easy the run was, it wasn't even until this point that I realized that I hadn't even gotten the v But this late in the run, there wasn't any point to picking it up. I dropped down into the abyss to fight the four, wait, five seats who had all loaded in at the same time. Due to how efficiently I could kill seats at this point, I defeated the boss before any of the others could aggro. After the fight, it turns out that all these seats were hollowed out, and resting at the bonfire actually despawned all of them. With the five seats dead, the end was nigh. I poured all of the degeneracy I had accumulated during this run into Guinevere's amazing chest bowl and opened the door to a majestic entourage of seats preluding the battle with the final boss, Synth Lord of Crystals. I had fought my way through countless tentacles and fields of multicolored crystals, endured hours of suspicious spaghetti sloshing noises, and cursed far more times than I actually got cursed in this run. I wasn't just going to let this end anticlimactically like the All Grin run. I had to make this fight something to remember. So what I did was... I never looked inside. Cool game! Okay, well that was the all Seath run. I hope you guys enjoyed. Um, very easy run. Very casual. That's right! That's right, he fucking killed himself before I even got close to the fog gate, and because I was outside the fog gate, it immediately played the Dark Lord ending. I can never catch a fucking break in these runs. <sighs> well, that was the all Seath run. Uh, honestly, this run was less of a challenge and more of a visual experience. Many of the Seaths just shot up into the Death Plane, something I anticipate would happen with other bosses such as Gaping Dragon or Calamite. It definitely wasn't as hard as other all-boss runs, but it was an experience nonetheless. I'd like to thank everyone who contributed to this project and the channel generally, and everyone who watched me shoot arrows into slimy dragons for hours on end. Thank you to everyone who has been sharing my videos and donating, it really helps me out and I swear I'm gonna get some more videos out. Until next time, this is Challenger Andy, reminding you that it usually is not as difficult as it seems, and you're casual until you try. See ya.